What's up, guys? We're back. We're doing another breakdown predictions video. This week, it's for UFC Atlantic City. And I like this card, actually. I see some people that don't like this card from a betting perspective and things like that. But I do. This is one of my biggest slates of the year. And I definitely feel like there's quite a few spots that are good here. So I'm excited to break this fight card down. And I'm doing this video at the same time because last week I put this video out um, a similar time to this. And I got more views, more likes, things like that. So if you guys want the video earlier in the week, just put down in the comments. Uh, if I get enough people that do want it earlier in the week, I will put it out earlier. But just because I got uh, that kind of reception last time, I'm going to try to put it out again at a similar time and see if we could uh, build off that. But if you guys want the video earlier, just make sure to put that down in the comments and Besides that, you know, hit the like button on this video. Let's try to get a lot of likes on this video, comments, engagement. You know how uh, it helps the algorithm and everything. And if you want to get access to my bets, patreon.com slash guru. Got quite a few bets this week. Looking at a few bets for uh, LFA tomorrow and uh, the Cage Warriors card. There's the, I believe, Uriah Faber's fight card is going on too. So there's a few other shows, but... For UFC, I already do have quite a few bets. And let's get into this fight card. We got Angel Pacheco taking on Kowlin Lofren in the first fight of the night. And Kowlin Lofren, he's a pretty big favor here. He's like a minus 360, uh, maybe a little bit shorter in some other places. But over 3-1 to one favorite taking on Pacheco. Uh, Pacheco's making his debut. He lost on the contender series, but he still got the contract, which I think he may be the only one to do that or him and one other person but it's gonna be his first UFC fight and Lofren he had to go over to France he fought Taylor Lapolis took the L there so he's trying to come back and get his first UFC victory and personally I feel like this is a great fight for Lofren to get the job done Pacheco dropping down to 135 pounds and you see there which is interesting I mean probably not gonna have that difficult of a weight cut because he was fighting at 145 his last fight i'm not sure if that's correct actually because i'm that doesn't make a lot of sense if he weighed 147 in the cage so maybe that's not correct but you see lawfren's a big 135er um with that 152 there but personally i just think pacheco he's a good boxer he's tough and he wins a lot of his fights through just guys beating him up and he's able to survive and then come back and beat him down the stretch but with Lawfren, I think that it's going to be the grappling that's going to be the difference in the fight. If Lawfren comes in with a good game plan, I feel like he's going to be able to take him down pretty easily. I think he could dominate him on the ground. And Pacheco's never been finished, so it would be a statement if Lawfren's able to get into a dominant position and pound him out or submit him on the ground. And I think he's going to be gunning to do that. So I wouldn't be shocked to see Lawfren win this fight inside the distance. And... I don't really think Pacheco has the ability to, the big power to knock him out on the feet. So I think that even in the stand up, Lawfren could compete pretty well. I don't think Lawfren's a bad striker. He should have the speed advantage. And I don't see him staying in the pocket and make it kind of a brawl like Pacheco wants. So I think it's a good fight for Lawfren to get the job done. Lawfren's not someone that tends to get tired. And. I just see Pacheco struggling in this matchup. So give me Kyle and Lawford to win. And I do think he's going to finish. So I'm going to say he either ground and pounds Pacheco out or submits him in the second or third round. And this next fight, we got Andre Petrowski. He's taking on Jacob Malkoon. And this one's a bit of a tricky fight to me. I feel like in terms of a pure pick, I got to go with Malkoon. I don't really like the line on Malkoon, but just the cardio on Petrowski I don't like. And... If he can't take down Malkoon early, who's shown to be a really good wrestler, I just don't trust his cardio. And that's really the crux of it with me for my prediction on this fight. But there's things that I think Petrovsky could definitely do to win here. It's Malkoon, he has a really good jab and he has decent distance control and striking on the feet. But I don't think he's very dangerous. So I, I feel like Petrovsky is the guy with the bigger power. Maybe he can land a big wild punch on him, but I just don't think that Petrovsky is that good on the feet. Um, 
I do see him potentially having a chance to get the submission early in the fight. If Malkoon wrestles early, maybe Petrovsky can do something and uh, find a submission there. But if it starts to get extended, I just feel like Malkoon's going to be the better fighter as it goes later. And ultimately, though, I just don't really have a lot of interest in this fight. I don't feel like I have a super great read, and I don't like the line. So it would be a pass for me betting-wise, but... As a pick, I'm going to say Malkoon wins via decision. And continuing on through the prelims, we've got Victoria Dudakova taking on Melissa Gatto here. Dudakova, she's making the move up to 125 after having her UFC debut at 115. And Melissa Gatto trying to bounce back from two losses in a row after being a hot prospect. So both these fighters have some adversity to work through coming into this fight. I guess Dudakova, she is coming in here on a win streak and all that she's never lost but she lost a little bit of stock in my opinion in her debut in the UFC I think a lot of people didn't find that fight to be that impressive from her and now she's moved to 125 so not necessarily sure how she's going to look at at this weight class either but I feel like Dudakova is very skilled she's young and this is a good fight I mean Gato is the favorite and I do get that, and I'm going to predict Gato to get the win, but I think Dudakova is a decent underdog ultimately because on the feet, I do think Dudakova has a lot of potential. She has fast hands. She has good boxing. She throws in combination. She has power. So she has some things that I really like about her on the feet. Um, I just feel like Gato is going to be able to take her down here. Gato has that good pressure she'll throw the front kicks to the body she has good one twos and good body lock takedown she can get you down against the cage and I feel like that could be the difference in the fight here I don't think Gato is going to likely get a submission just because I've seen her on the ground against girls that I don't think are probably as good of grapplers as Dudakova in terms of jiu-jitsu and she wasn't able to submit them when she got into grappling situations so Dudakova will probably be able to survive on the ground, but I think that if Gatto gets on top, she'll be able to control her if she makes smart decisions, and that's kind of going to be the deciding factor in the fight. You know, Gatto has had certain matchups where she's really accepted being on her back and lost moments due to that, and if she goes for submissions here after getting on top and lets Dudakova take top position, like, going for an arm bar from from the back or something like that and falling into her full guard, then I think that Dudakova maybe could steal the fight. And if it stays standing, I think it'll be close. But I'm just going to go with Gatto because I think she's a little bit more proven and I like her wrestling a little bit more. And I think Dudakova has potential, but I think this is a little bit of a step up too fast competition and I think she'll be back, but... I'm going to say Gato wins via decision. And with this next fight, we got Ibo Islan taking on Anton Turkali in a rematch from their fight, I believe, in 2020. And since then, Ibo Islan has gone undefeated, but he's kind of gone back to can crushing. The only decent opponent that he defeated was the fighter that he beat on the Contender Series. And Anton, he made his way to the UFC shortly after that victory and has not done well in the UFC. He lost his last three fights and definitely is kind of in a do or die position here so it's a hard fight to really be definitively confident on either side because you look at Ibo Aslan he hasn't proven that he's better at all since that last fight with Anton Turkali in terms of the things that he struggled with in that fight he did I will say maybe show a little bit more composure and technicality on the feet in his contender series fight but it was really quick once again ended in the first round and all his wins have ended in the first round so didn't get see him get extended didn't see any grappling situations really in that fight whatsoever and with Anton Turkali I mean if you look at their first fight Ebo was dominating the first round you know he landed a lot of hard leg kicks he rocked Turkali out a few instances But ultimately, he got tired, and then Turkali in the second round took his back and submitted him. So I don't think we've really seen anything that could 
in my opinion, sway my mind into that's not going to happen again because I just haven't seen Aslan extended. And even though Turkali did get knocked out by someone like Tyson Pedro, I feel like Pedro, for all his faults, is still someone that's a lot more experienced than Aslan and has more precision striking early in the fight when he's fresh. And if Turkali could survive the first round like he did the first time with Aslan, like he did with Vitor Petrino and some of these other guys, then I do think that Aslan's going to fatigue and Turkali's probably going to be able to create another grappling scenario, whether it's from Aslan slipping on a kick again or it's a takedown and find that submission. So I'm going with Turkali. I'm going to say he wins via second round submission again. But I do agree with the line because Aslan definitely could knock him out in the first round. He almost did the first fight, and that's why it's a close fight. But I'm going to say that Turkali can get the win by extending it and getting the job done in the second. And with this next fight, we got Dennis Bazukia. He's taking on Connor Matthews. And this is a tough one to predict, too, because I feel like both these guys are a little bit lower level for the UFC, and you don't exactly know if they're, if they're you know, on this caliber but they're matched up against each other so one of them is gonna have to is gonna have to win right and that's to me what makes it tough because i feel like both these guys are not going to be you know super long time ufc vets but dennis bazookia he had an okay debut with sean woodson in terms of came in on short notice and was able to go the distance and look like he fought hard there but really bad fight his last fight with Jamal Emmers. I mean, the guy just got absolutely obliterated early, no resistance. Uh, so that was a bad look to me. Even though I do rate Emmers highly, he just blitzed through Bazookia and made Bazookia look really bad in that one. So he has to get the win here, Dennis. You know, he can't go 0-3 in the UFC and look bad in all his fights. I mean, maybe the UFC will give him a fourth fight on his contract just to close it out but I think that would be it if he loses this fight so he needs to come in here and you know have a big performance and Connor Matthews making his debut here and he actually had to come in the hard way I mean two fights on the contender series had to fight some pretty good opponents the contender series he lost the first time and got the win the second time his loss to Francis Marshall he did get kind of dominated by a guy that didn't do the greatest in the UFC so that's not the best look but I do think that Connor Matthews is not bad. I do think that he can compete with Bazookia and it's a good fight. Um, you look at Dennis early on in the fight, I think he might have the superior striking, be able to land clean on Matthews. Matthews has good offensive striking, like he throws nice one twos, he has power, um, decent ability to counter and stay in the pocket, but he has bad defense, doesn't move his head at all, very hittable. So, if you have, you know, decent counter-punching or pressure striking, you can land on him pretty clean. And he has a good ability to take shots, uh, get hurt and come back. But early on, I think Bazookia, if when he's fresh, maybe could tee off on Matthews, have a lot of success. But I don't know if he necessarily has that power to knock Matthews out or get him out of there. And I, even though Bazuki has good training partners in terms of wrestling and grappling, he doesn't really look like he's the greatest at that, especially offensively. I don't think his wrestling looks that good when he goes to it. So Marshall was able to mix in takedowns, which I think really helped him win that fight with Matthews. And I don't think that Bazuki is going to be able to get the takedowns here. And if it becomes a war and this fight gets extended, I, I do think that Matthews has the better cardio and when both these guys kind of come down to similar speed athleticism level because Bazookia gets a little bit tired Matthews skills may be a little bit better um Matthews has just fought really subpar bad competition he hasn't really proven himself that much he got a big win his last fight but I think this is his chance to kind of show that he deserves to be here and I just trust Matthews a little bit more. I, I think Bazookia, he's going to start fast, but I think Matthews is going to hang in there and get the win down the stretch here. And uh, I could see him getting a finish in the second or third. So 
Connor Matthews is going to be the pick for me in this one. And uh, I think he's going to get the job done here. And this next fight this is a pretty easy fight to predict. Not uh, going to be a long breakdown here. We got Julio Arce taking on Herbert Burns. And Julio Arce, if you're uh, someone that's been around the channel for a while, you know that I usually pick Arce in a lot of his fights. I'm a fan of his style. I think that he's a very, very solid guy. And Herbert Burns, I mean, it's 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 really hard to just straight up pick him in any fight at this point after his last one. I mean, lost due to exhaustion, kind of a really, really bad performance. Now he's had a long layoff coming back. He's older. So none of that is going to help his cardio more than likely. And he's facing a really solid veteran that is going to be hard to just steamroll early, which is what Her Herbert Burns' path to victory usually is. So I just think Arce is going to be able to use his jab. He's going to be able to use his superior striking and uh, really beat up Herbert Burns on the feet, avoid the big knees and big power from Burns early, and defend a few takedowns, and I think at that point, Burns will be really susceptible to getting finished. Uh, Arce could just show him the door. It seems like he's very mentally weak, Herbert Burns, and mentally breakable. So I just think Arce is probably going to be able to finish him. It's just early on in the fight, Arce, if he does get taken down, you know, just stay calm. I think he's only been submitted one time in his career, so that's a good indication that he probably can survive on the ground. It's just he needs to not panic or make any big mistakes and just don't get caught with anything crazy early and you should get the job done. And with someone like a who's a veteran like Julio Arce, who I think is trustworthy, who's going to fight smart, fight to a game plan that's not going to get tired, that is going to have the crowd on his side being a, more of a local fighter here, is probably going to get the win. I mean... Burns has a chance to get the job done in the first round just because he's a dangerous guy. But I think Arce winning in the second or third via KO TKO is probably the most likely result in this matchup here. And this next fight, we got a good one. We got a class of styles. We got Virna Jandaroba, who has been upsetting a lot of people recently, you know, busting a lot of parlays, gotten two big upset victories in a row, and kind of put herself in title contention. And she's going to be taking on Lupi Godinez, who. Has been a little bit up and down in the UFC, but has been more up than down and has been impressive in her victories. And now is getting a chance to kind of break into that top five with the win here. And it's an interesting matchup because I feel like Verna on the feet has gotten a lot better in terms of she has gotten more athletic. She moves around and has faster feet. And Godinez is still a little bit plotty with her pressure, so... Virna, you know, with their new found striking, you know, she can move around, throw some one twos, and then get some respect at least because she does have some power. Then that could make for an interesting striking battle. And obviously, Godinez has good wrestling, but she doesn't really have great control on the feet or on the ground, excuse me. And she's not going to be wanting to go to the ground with someone like Virna. I think that if this fight becomes more of of a ground fight, Viren is going to find that submission eventually. I, I just think Godinez puts herself in too many disadvantageous positions on the ground at certain times, makes some mistakes, and I think Virna would probably end up submitting her. But something just kind of tells me that Lupi is going to be able to wear down Virna with their pressure and with maybe punching power and speed with their hand speed on their feet. Uh, I think that Virna is going to surprise some people early by doing well in the stand-up. But I think as the fight goes on, we're going to see Lupi be able to find a range a little bit more, cut the cage off better. And when they actually get in more boxing exchanges, I think Lupi is just going to have the cleaner hands, the better combinations. I think Virna is going to be relying a little bit too much on her, on her power. And I do think that Virna will get tired. So... Lupi has had some fights where people were questioning, like, why she didn't wrestle, why she didn't go to the ground. So hopefully in this one, you know, people aren't questioning like, why she did go to the ground and get submitted. You know, she needs to keep it standing and show that fight IQ here. And uh, I think it's a, a fight where the underdog does have a chance to to win here for sure. But I'm going to go with Lupi Godinez to get the win. And... 
we got the main event of the prelims, guaranteed banger fight right here. Anytime Nate Landwehr is in the cage, I'm tuning in, and you know it's going to be all action. And he's taking on another guy that is maligned by some people because of certain matchups and you know having skills and being a ball dropper certain points but he always produces really fun fights as well the guy uh jamal emers he's very fun to watch so matchup wise this is an awesome matchup and i think it's pretty straightforward how you break down this fight i mean you look at jamal emers i think that skill wise he's the better fighter he's going to be a lot more athletic he's going to have the cleaner boxing better footwork faster hands he has decent power you know we saw him sit down and take out Dennis Bazookia really quick in his last fight which probably gave him a lot of confidence he is the better kicker I mean if you look at it from a technical perspective when both these guys have a full gas tank when they're both mentally on point Jamal Emers is going to be a lot better striker and Emers has really good wrestling he has good grappling I mean everything about Emers that you need skill wise he has but the issue with Jamal Emers is the mental aspect in fights and I don't even think he has a cardio issue per se but it's more just these lapses in judgment where he makes a mistake and he loses the fight and with Nate Landwehr that's um you know Nate Landwehr's exact game you know he goes out there he tries to come forward take a lot of damage early keep that high guard so um he can absorb some shots and usually gets dropped gets hurt really bad even in his wins and he's able to absorb all that damage you know keep coming forward and break you down and eventually when you get tired and you make that mistake Landwehr is making you pay and he's finishing you with either a front choke uh TKO in you or running away with the second and third round so that's gonna be Nate Landwehr's path to victory here you know he's gonna have to take that uh, beating up front from Jamal Emers and really get probably pieced up, tagged up early in the fight. And he's going to have to rely on Emers either fading and then Nate Landwehr being able to get him out of there that way or just making a mental mistake and Landwehr capitalizing and getting the finish. If that doesn't happen, I think Emers can win via decision. I think he can win via first round uh, knockout or submission, drop, drop in Landwehr and submitting him. Um, but we've also seen instances, for instance, like Jamal Emers' fight with Julian Arosa, where he's winning the entire fight and then gets caught in a front choke after uh, he gets dropped from constant pressure later in the fight. And then we've seen him go uh, leg lock for leg lock with someone like Pat Sabatini. So it's just these things that at that number, at the uh, line that he's at right now, it's hard to justify betting him and I definitely think it's a dog or pass but I'm going to predict uh, Jamal Emers as the winner just a pure pick but man I would uh I wouldn't mind seeing Nate Landwehr win uh, here in that post fight interview but I'm going to say Jamal Emers is able to get the victory and starting off the main card we got another banger fight with Chidi and Jaquani taking on Reese McKee and Chidi and Jaquani, I'm really surprised him coming down to 170. I, I don't really know how he's going to do that. So uh, we'll see him at weigh-ins tomorrow and see exactly what's up. I mean, I feel like he's going to struggle to make that weight. And if he does, I don't know how he's going to perform on fight night. And I think that's been a big narrative this week. But Chidi, you know, he's coming off a couple losses. He had his little moment where he went on that run. He made it close to top 15 or maybe he did get ranked but uh ended up taking that loss to Gregory and then he lost to Mihao and I think he lost another fight but uh he hasn't been on a good run recently and making the drop down to 170 which I don't really know it's going to be even if he makes the weight I'm not sure how it's going to be a big jump to his career I don't think it's necessarily going to be uh that solving factor for him but he's taking on Reese McKee, who's a big 170 in his own right. He's going to be kind of matching the frame that Njikawani has, which is even big for when Njikawani was at 185. But Reese McKee, he's another one of these guys. I think there's quite a few of these guys on, on this card, coincidentally. But someone that takes a lot of damage early and then is able to survive that, come back late, and finish you off. And he brings the pressure 
He has decent uh, grappling, decent striking, bad striking defense, but creates wars and he's able to uh, finish guys late or really make fights entertaining, like in his losses to Alex Morono and things like that. And he's had struggles with guys that could take him down. But Chidi Njikwani is not going to bring that element. I don't see Njikwani hitting any takedowns here. And ultimately, the 170 factor is what brings me over the edge to go with McKee. If it was at 185, I think Chidi Njikwani maybe could run through him early. But at 170, I just think that the pressure from McKee is going to drain Njikwani, who's already going to be drained from the weight cut. He doesn't like that forward pressure. He has... An ability to land clean on you and knock you out because he has a really good kickboxing, he has power, but he gets bad defensively, kind of spastic, and slows down tremendously as the fights go on, even at 185. And Reese McKee is going to get better as the fight goes on, and I think Reese McKee is going to get the finish in the second or third, more than likely the second round, I would say. And, uh, yeah, if this fight happens, which I'm a little bit skeptical of even, I'm going to be curious to see the weigh-ins tomorrow. I think Reese McKee is going to get the finish. So give me Reese McKee to get his first UFC victory. And with this next fight, we got another fighter that I'm very confident in, and that's Bill Algio to get this victory here over Kyle Nelson. Kyle Nelson, he's been on a good little run recently. He got a big upset over Fernando Padilla, but I think that the buck stops here with this fight with Bill Algio. I think Bill Algio is going to be able to land a lot of kicks i think that nelson's gonna struggle with the king game and the movement of algio i don't think algio is gonna get tired uh from the pressure and i don't think he's gonna be able to really land his jab nelson that is i don't think nelson is gonna get algio to stand in the pocket with him i see algio being able to move be very evasive and nelson's a little bit of a stiff guy. I think that Aljo is going to have a big advantage in terms of movement there in the cage. And Nelson may try to grapple here, but I feel like Bill Aljo is extremely hard to hold down. He's hard to knock out. He's going to have the higher volume. He's going to be the better scrambler. He's going to have better jujitsu. And I just think Nelson is going to struggle to land a lot clean. I think missing and being unsuccessful is going to make Nelson tired. And I think Aljo is going to be able to really take over the fight as it goes on. I think he's going to be able to start to chip away and dominate. And Aljo's not necessarily a big finisher. But Nelson's a guy that you've seen previously when fights don't go his way. He could really struggle and start to fall apart. So I wouldn't be shocked to see Bill Aljo be able to get him out of there in the second or third round. But I do think that Aljo is just going to be too skillful here. He's going to be too... Light on his feet. I think he's going to be making Nelson miss. He's going to be moving around Nelson. He's going to be able to get the better of the grappling exchanges if they do happen in this fight. And I think his kicks are going to be a, a big factor. I think he's going to land a lot of leg kicks. I think eventually he's going to set up kicks high to the head by going low throughout the beginning of the fight. And I think he'll be able to land his um, funky punches and certain exchanges and be tough, you know, like he always is, have the cardio, and get that win. I think he's a tough style to deal with. I mean, unless you can knock him out early or take him down and really have great top control, you're going to struggle. So give me Bill Algio, and I think he's going to be able to get this one done pretty easily. And up next here, we got Nurselton Ruzaboa taking on Cedricus Dumas. And weird line to me, tough fight to break down. I feel like the line is wide. I mean... You look at Nurselton Ruzabu's debut in the UFC, a lot of people were questioning whether he was a fraud or whether he was UFC level. He had really low-level competition. He had some suspect losses and goes out there, blasts uh, Bruno Silva early, and now he's a massive favorite or pretty significant favorite in this fight with Cedricus Dumas, who had a bad UFC debut but has bounced back with a couple wins and looked good. And uh, I'm kind of surprised that the lines as wide it is it as wide as it is i'm not sure that uh people should have as much confidence in ruzabov as they do after just one performance but i do like that ruzabov went to train over there in philly with those guys that are extremely good grapplers like petrosky sean brady and 
that was his deficiency in his fights. You know, he's been able to get taken down, controlled on the ground. His wrestling wasn't good. He relies on the Kimura and certain submissions off his back to cre- sweep guys and get on top where he's the most dangerous. And um, training over there with uh, that team, he probably will be able to lose some of those bad tendencies, get better with his wrestling, and that'll make him a much better fighter overall because he's already super dangerous. I mean, the, on the feet, six foot five, extremely tall, long, lanky guy who has nice straight punches and one punch power, very explosive. And those are all really good attributes to have. But Cedricus Dumas, I think, is going to be a, a new look for Ruzabov. You know, he is going to be fighting someone that has longer reach than him, that's going to be extremely athletic like him. And I think it's going to be potentially kind of a boring fight on the feet because Ruzabov likes to counter with the straight punches. And Dumas being so long... And knowing that, I could see both these guys kind of just standing in front of each other and not throwing too much, trying to keep it at distance and it being a boring fight. And Dumas, though, I do think has the better wrestling, which is what makes this fight tricky because, like I said, Ruzabov went to the camp that could solve that issue for him. He has a dangerous submission game. Dumas isn't a elite grappler or wrestler, but... I think he's a very good athlete. I think that he could take down Ruzabov and probably, if he can avoid that Kimura, control him on top and do well that way. But you don't know if you could trust Dumas to do that for three rounds. And even in his last fight with the Zaytar, like he got the takedown, but it was only because of a you know a weird uh, scramble and grappling initiated from a Zaytar. So. Dumas isn't someone that's going to really initiate that grappling. That's why I see it being potentially a a really low-volume kind of striking fight that people are coming into this fight with high expectations. It's going to be really fun to watch, and then it kind of chits the bed. That's a little bit of what I'm thinking with this fight. But ultimately, I think the striking is going to be close, and I feel as if... Wrestling-wise, Dumas has the advantage. Maybe Ruzabov has the advantage in the grappling. Um, but having said that, the fact that I think this fight is pretty close from a, a skill perspective, from an athleticism perspective, um, and the line is where it is, I'm going to predict Dumas to get the victory here. So, Cedricus Dumas is going to be the prediction. And this next fight, I kind of already tipped my hand on this one. But I got Chris Weidman here. I, I like this just from uh, the number, I think you have to pick Chris. I mean, if it was a pick or something like that, then I would go with Bruno. But, man, I think Chris Weidman has a, has a really good matchup here to get the win. And I ultimately know that a lot of people are going to be looking at all the negatives. And that is, uh, you know, why he would lose the fight if he does lose. But matchup-wise, if you just look at it from that perspective, I think that... Bruno Silva, you know, he's a guy that's taken a lot of damage on the feet striking-wise. And usually he's a brawler, but you go and look at his last fight, he's wrestling in that fight against a a much better striker than Chris Weidman. But I think that's telling. I think that that shows... You look at his fight with Alex Pereira, Bruno didn't go in there with that game plan to wrestle. He went in there with the strike. And now he's kind of, I think, maybe knowing that his durability is not as good as it once was. Even though Chris Weidman's durability is something that you could really question, he has a a primary skill set that's not striking that he can use. Where Bruno Silva is a black belt, but no submission wins, seven submission losses, and his wrestling is just not up to par. You see him get dominated uh, by Andrew Sanchez almost for three straight rounds before Sanchez gets tired and Silva finishes him with... uh, punches late in the fight you see uh Wellington Terman you know throwing Bruno Silva around getting easy single legs which is what Chris Weidman is famous for you know having one of the best singles of all time um and you know giving up his back to Wellington you know getting put in positions where Wellington's close on a Kimura and if you give those positions to Weidman, even though he's older, he's still going to be very, very good grappler and could 
take advantage of that, get the submission. And Bruno obviously is the better striker prototypically, but I think people aren't talking about enough about his durability as well. I mean, even though Weidman definitely is the lesser durable of the two, like, and Bruno has the power advantage and is going to be faster, and if he touches that chin, I would be very worried. But um, Bruno's getting dropped by guys that are not good strikers. He's getting dropped by GM3, by Brendan Allen, you know, so I don't think it's necessarily like out of the realm possibility that Weidman lands a shot on Silva and hurts him either. So I think that the stand up, both these guys are a little bit damaged goods, and that's where Silva has to had to rely on in the past, you know, being a brawler, take a shot to get on the inside, and then end in the fight. Um, and if he doesn't have that anymore, I don't think he can beat a grappler like Chris Weidman. I, I think Weidman is going to be able to take him down and probably be able to submit him here. Um, Silva, if he starts to get taken down, he's going to get tired. So even if Weidman gets tired as well, I think it'll kind of balance out. Um, so I'm going to go with Weidman via submission in this fight, and I think that it's going to be... To me, I would hope his last fight, he goes out there and lays the gloves down. Doesn't seem like he wants to do that. But I would hope that he goes out there, gets the win here, uh, retires, and uh, sails out in the sunset. But I'm going to say Chris Weidman wins via submission. And in the co-main event here, we got a fight that I'm not too interested in from a betting perspective. And I totally agree with the line being pretty much a pick em because two guys that are powerful that can finish you but they're a little bit glass cannons at this point and it's crazy to say that about someone like Vicente Luque who's a tank for so many years a guy that's been known as uh having one of the best chins the toughness and everything that uh I'm not saying that he is when I'm calling him a glass cannon but since he had that brain bleed um came back I feel like he was a little bit afraid to get hit in that fight with RDA. And even in the Jeff Neal fight, he ended up getting knocked out. But during that fight, you could see he was, he was not really committing to his punches. It seemed like he was having huge reactions to getting hit. And that's a little bit scary. I mean, when you got a style like Luke, if you can't depend on your chin, you know, it's, it's going to be tough to really progress in this division. I mean, I know he was able to go out there and out-wrestle RDA, but that was the first guy that he was able to take down in years in the UFC. So even though Luke has really good grappling, usually it comes through pressuring guys, chopping them down with the leg kicks, beating them up with uh, his good hands, and then them shooting and him catching them in a choke or him reversing when they shoot getting on top and finishing them from the top position but I don't think there's going to be very many guys and I don't think Buckley just this physicality um being a former 185er having a wrestling background that Luke is going to be able to just go in there and control against the fence or take down like he did versus RDA and on the feet Buckley is going to be in my opinion, even though his durability is questionable as well, he's been finished, I believe, four or five times via knockout. He's not afraid to get hit at this point. He's still, I think, a little bit fresher and more mentally there than Luke is at this point in their careers. And the South Pie dynamic is big. I mean, it takes away the leg kicks from Luke, which is going to make the ability of Buckley to move around and dart in, dart out, and be explosive, more pronounced, because Luke is not going to be able to slow him down with those kicks. And Luke just has had a lot of struggle over Southpaw, so that's an advantage for Buckley. And I think Buckley catch him and knock him out here. I, I just don't think that Luke is going to be able to take him down or control him against the fence. I think he's going to be a little bit hesitant to engage, so I think Buckley's going to be able to dart in, dart out, use his speed, land, have power, and whether he knocks him out or he decisions Luke, I just think Luke is not going to be able to pull the trigger here. And uh, Buckley's going to be able to get the win. But what's kind of pulling me away from being super, super confident in Buckley 
is Luke still has that power. He still is that technical guy that could land a check hook in the first round or a clean shot and knock Buckley out. I just don't like Buckley's uh, chin enough to really trust him either. But I do think at this point in their careers, Buckley is going to be the pick for me to win. And I'll say he wins via second or third round KO, TKO. And finally, we got the main event. We got Aaron Blanchfield taking on Manon Firo in a number one contenders fight that you could argue are is really a title fight. I mean, you look at the girls that are likely going to be in the title fight with Raquel Pennington and Juliana Pena. Obviously, Raquel Pennington won a vacant title. She didn't take the belt from the real champion. And I think that Blanchfield and Faro would be favored over both those girls of potential matchups. So you could argue, maybe not necessarily that the, this is the champion, that's not the right word to say, but that this is the best fighter in the division in the world. So for 125 female. Um, but, man, really good fight. Class Styles, Manon Firo. She has been pretty dominant in the UFC. I mean, I believe she's maybe dropped like one or two rounds. Blanchfield, she's had a couple fights. Um, you know, J.J. Aldridge's fight. Um, I think maybe one other one where she has had to bow through adversity early and then come back and get the win. But she's shown that she's able to do that very well. And when you look at stylistically how these girls match up, I mean, on the feet, you definitely have to give the edge to Faro, right? She's going to have the significant speed advantage. She has that ability to dart in, dart out with the one twos, one one twos. She has that lead leg sidekick that she uses really effectively. And I think in this fight, really for Faro, it, it's going to be imperative for her to maintain the center of the cage. And you see that in certain fights, she's really diligent about doing that, especially early in the fight when she's at her freshest. Like, if you look at her fight with Jennifer Maya, if you go back, you watch that first round. I mean, it was awesome the way that Faro was uh, circling left, circling right, avoiding getting backed up to the fence and just being the matador, you know, landing that check hook, landing the uh, one twos, one one twos. She's really pretty basic in what she does. She really throws a lot of uh, the same strikes, but. She is able to do it with power. She's very explosive. And she has the footwork to kind of dance around girls and then pressure girls and uh, bomb them out of there when she has that type of advantage too. So Faro is hard to deal with and she's very physical. Like That's why I think she, in this fight she needs to pressure forward, maintain the center of that cage. And um, when Blanchfield tries to engage in any type of clinch or grappling, just disengage. Just try to frame push away try to negate the clinch and don't engage in uh any grappling situations with Blanchfield because I think that'll make Blanchfield more comfortable and if she can just keep it on the feet maintain the center pressure Blanchfield and keep it a striking fight then she's probably gonna have a lot of success but I do think that you know I've heard mixed opinions like some people talk about they don't think Fro slows down some people think they do and I do think there's certain indications that she does get tired I mean maybe they're subtle but you see like I said early in the fights like round one in that fight with um when she fought Maya it was very evident that the game plan was to never get backed up behind that double black line but you see in the third round when she's more tired she's really relying a lot more on the sidekick she's not exploding in as fast with her punches and she's getting backed up to the fence, and she's circling a lot um, wider, using the cage a lot more to try to move away and not engage as much. And those are the type of mistakes that you don't want to make against Blanchfield or just what you can't afford to have happen is get tired and start to put your back against the fence more because that's where Blanchfield is going to thrive at in this fight. You know, she's going to want to push you against the cage, and although she really struggles to get the takedown, like you saw in the Tyler fight or... Um, some of her other fights recently, she's relentless and eventually she will be able to get it to the ground if you give her those type of opportunities by slowing down and starting to get backed up and engaging in the clinch and things like that. And Blanchard's striking isn't the best. I mean, she's stiff and it doesn't seem like she has the craziest power, but she has that don't give a fuck type of, you know, aura and ability where she can walk through the fire and that's what you need with Fro. She has to be able to walk through Fro's shots, not give Fro that respect. And if she can eat her power shots early, um, 
you know, maybe land a few up top on Fro and then get a takedown or two. I think that why I'm going to Blanchard in this fight, one is because of cardio and uh, I think just will to win international on Blanchard's side is at a, you know, super high level. But I just think Blanchard needs one moment in this fight to get the job done where if she can get into an advantageous position on the ground, she could finish the fight. And with Manon Faro, if she wins, she's going to have to be pretty much perfect for 25 minutes where she's going to have to have her cardio on point, be moving, avoid the takedown, knock it on the ground. And I'm not saying that one takedown and it's over for Faro. I think Faro is a black butt as well. But I do think that there's a possibility that you know, if they get into one position in a scramble or something happens, that Blanchfield can end the fight in a snap. So I'm going to go with Blanchfield, and I think she is going to get the finish in the fourth or, or the fifth. I think that's potentially decent plays there. Um, I get it on the money line, you know, why people would be going with Faro. I feel like maybe it could be a little bit uh, closer odds, but I just think Blanchfield is going to get the job done here. So give me Aaron Blanchfield to get the win. And uh, there you have it, guys. It's full card predictions, breakdowns for this card. Thanks for watching. Make sure to hit that like button. Like I said at the start of the video, I put the video out today because last week I put the video out at a similar time and got more views. So hoping that happens again. But if you guys do want it back earlier in the week, just put comments down below. And if I get enough comments, if I get 10 comments that's asking me to put the video out earlier, I will go back to doing that next week. So just let me know. And uh, besides that, man, for my most confident pick on this card, I'm going to go with Julio Arce. For the parlay of the week, I'll say Bill Algio gets the win, Julio Arce gets the win, and Kylan Lawfring gets the win. So I'll be back soon breaking down another fight card. Go to patreon.com slash guru, support the channel. Would really appreciate that and get access to some good bets, some good content. And I'll talk to you guys later, guys.